Don Milner. Hello. Uh, I'm here representing the American public. And when the NTP conducts a study, it's done for the purpose of identifying hazards, potential human health hazards, and to provide information that can be used in risk assessment, which would be used to determine whether there is a, a significant risk and whether that risk should be lowered by lowering exposures. So what I want to talk about is the utility of the NTP data on cell phone radio frequency radiation for assessing health risks. But also, I want to go back and provide a little bit of the rationale for this study uh, since this began many years ago. Go down. Okay, in 2000, I was asked to take on the cell phone radio frequency radiation project. Didn't know where to begin. Uh, somehow, it led to a phone call to Perry Wilson at NIST. Uh, we started discussing reverberation chambers. This led to interactions with ITIS, and you heard yesterday the consequence of all that interaction in terms of the creation of the reverberation chambers, the determination of exposures, and the dosimetry. So from the other end, on the biology, the per I want to look at the objective. The objective was, as with most NTP toxicity studies, to test the null hypothesis. And to test a null hypothesis, you have to challenge the null hypothesis. Now, at that time, people, physicists and engineers in particular, were saying cell phone radio frequency radiation at non-thermal or, or minimally thermal intensities is incapable of inducing adverse effects. There's not enough energy to break bonds. That's why it's non-ionizing. It can't break, cause DNA damage. And we didn't know a mechanism by which it could cause an adverse effect. So the purpose was, first of all, we got to challenge the null hypothesis. And if we identify adverse effects, provide the dose response data that can be used to assess potential health risks for any of these effects. So going back to then, how do we design this particular study? When NTP conducts a study, we don't want to expose animals to what humans are exposed to or can be potentially exposed to because we're dealing with small group size and trying to identify low level risks, which might be one in a thousand, which you can't identify with an experimental group of a uh, hundred or fifty animals, or one in ten thousand. Uh, so typically, the studies are done at higher exposures, characterize a dose response, and use that information to quantify risk. So, with the cell phone radiation, we run into a different type of problem because we can't expose to much higher because we would induce heating effects. So we decided to maintain, conduct a thermal pilot study to determine what could animals tolerate and still be able to thermoregulate their body temperature with less than a one degree centigrade raise, rise. Now, why did we check pick one degree? The FCC's limit is based on a body uh, thermal, uh, temperature rise of one degrees, it was estimated to be at four watts per kilogram. And in fact, when we began the study, we thought that was going to be the highest level, four watts per kilogram. From the four watt per kilogram, the FCC divided by 10 to come up with the occupational exposure of 0.4 watts per kilogram, and another factor of five to come up with the human. These were just cut points, and also identified spatial SARs of 1.6 watt per kilogram averaged over any one gram of tissue and 8 watts per kilogram for occupational exposures. So if we're going to characterize risk, target organ risk, the important value is that 1.6 watts per kilogram. Because if we expose animals 
to a much lower level, such as the whole body exposure of humans, the dosimetry in the brain would be lower than is permissible by the FCC. And people would say, oh, you got a negative study? That's what we expected. Yeah, so because we were limited by the heating effect, to challenge that null hypothesis, daily exposures were extended up to nine hours per day. And there had been other studies in which animals were restrained. We did not want the animals to be restrained. And that's how we came up with a reverberation chamber. At that time, we were considering studying frequencies 900 and 1900 for both modulation, CDMA, and GSM. But early on, Niels Kuster's group provided their initial dosimetry model where they compared the organ-specific SAR to the whole body SAR and produced this kind of graph. And this was discussed a little bit yesterday. But you can see with the mouse at 900 megahertz, most of the uh, absorbed dose is in the tail. Similarly for the rat at 1.9 uh, gigahertz. That was not the objective of the study to find out what happens to the rat or mouse tail. We were most interested in was the brain because that had been defined earlier from IARC studies and some of the human studies. And you can see at that time we were looking at a minimally different SAR in the brain compared to the whole body. And as was mentioned yesterday, the fat is low. There are other organs that vary. So when you expose the whole body, we're not going to get a straight line across all tissues. But the particular one that we wanted the most emphasis was on the brain and not on the tail. OK, so the results that are in the technical reports show I think quite clearly that the null hypothesis has been disproven. There were perinatal effects. There were dose-related reductions in pup birth weights with both modulations and in pup and in weight gains of pups and dams during lactation. We've uh, discussed a lot about the heart. There are proliferative lesions, which included both malignant schwannoma and Schwann cell hyperplasia in male rats exposed to GSM and CDMA. There's also uh, cardiomyopathy in the right ventricle in both male and female rats with both modulations. This occurred early because there was a 14-week interim sacrifice. The effects were dose-related. There was increased severity with increasing exposure. And there were increased incidences and trends of DNA damage in the brains of rats and mice. Also, there were many equivocal conclusions. But the proliferative responses of both neoplasms and preneoplasm lesions with both GSM and CDMA indicate that this study has identified certain target organ effects, which have been called equivocal, but they equivocal to some agencies, uh, such as some of the regulatory agencies, means ignore. And I'm concerned that when we see a target organ effect, they cannot be ignored. So two of the target organs that have that equivocal uh, name next to them that I want to focus on are the brain and the prostate. So the data that is available for the brain and with both the GSM and CDMA exposures show that there were gliomas in both, uh, with both exposures. There were also glial cell hyperplasias, which are part of the continuum of the process, the cancer process leading to adenoma and carcinoma. Is also, if we total these, there's a total proliferative effect with both GSM and CDMA. To me, there's some evidence going on that this is definitely a target organ effect that should not be ignored. Uh, in addition, on these bees, I looked at some of the individual animal tumor data, uh, pathology data, and some of those glial cell hyperplasias were considered to be uh, high severity, more severity. 
So you, we're dealing with a severity issue on lesions. When there's marked severity, these are close to being uh, indicated as a tumor. They're called glial cell hyperplasias at this point, but when you look at the total picture there, the brain is obviously a target organ and should not be dismissed. Now, in 2016, NTP reported that the brain hyperplastic lesions and neoplasms of the heart and brain are considered likely the result of whole body exposures to GSM or CDMA modulated RFR. But in the technical report, it says now there was some evidence of carcinogenic activity of GSM and CDMA modulated cell phone radio frequency radiation uh, in male spray dolly rats based on schwannomas in the heart. The incidence of malignant glioma in the brain may have been related, meaning equivocal, ignore, to GSM and modulated cell phones. So I ask, what is the new evidence that led to a different uh, kind of conclusion. Switching a little bit to the other organ, the prostate gland. As far as I recall, NTP has never identified a prostate carcinogen. Uh, Dave Mark, I think, indicated yesterday that maybe they did identify one. Uh, this is, although the historical control data are something that we got to take with a grain of salt, it does indicate how often this shows up in uh, studies. It's, it's a rare tumor. You can see because the one uh, or the two identified in this study make up the historical control right here uh, that we're seeing adenoma carcinoma, 7.8% with a range of 0 to 2 percent. This is a very unusual finding. And when we look at hyperplasia, in all those groups there is an increase in epithelial hyperplasia, part of the preneoplastic lesion, with increasing severity with dose. And when we look at this in total, we're finding significant effects at the 3 watt per kilogram and at the 6 watt per kilogram. I contend that this is not just suggestive, this is evidence, convincing evidence of a target organ effect that should not be ignored. So you ask the question, what about survival differences between exposed and sham? That's a good question. But taking a look at some of the data, the CDMA, 6 watt per kilogram group, had the highest tumor incidence of all the groups. This, at week 93, uh, this is the CDM 6 watt per kilogram compared to the control. At week 93, these were identical. Prior to that, the CDMA 6 watt per kilogram had a lower survival. Statist it was not statistically significant over the course of the two year study. So, another aspect, looking at, again, some of the uh, individual animal pathology data. There were no glial cell hyperplasias or schwannomas in the control or sham group. A glial cell hyperplasia was detected in an exposed rat as early as week 58 of the study. And a heart schwannoma was detected as early as week 70 in exposed rats. Therefore, I contend that survival was sufficient to detect either the tumors or precancerous lesions in the brain and heart of the sham group. Now there's ex some explanation that uh, there was reduction in chronic progressive nephropathy. And when you look at the CPN severity score of 3.7, it's extremely high. In the 1990s, when NTP was conducting studies Severity scores for chronic progressive nephropathy was a cause of death that led the NTP to switch their diets from uh, NIH 07 to NTP 2000 to reduce the protein. This kind of score is something which is much higher than was observed during the 1990s and is a score that you find for a renal toxicant. 
And that's what is reported in the controls. Why it's so high, I don't have an explanation, and maybe it will be provided. Uh, Dr. Meldick, you need to wrap up here. We're way behind okay. okay. I just got a couple more slides. I just wanted to hit one issue related to the mouse, because that's listed also as equivocal. There's brain, uh, I'm sorry, lung, alveolar, bronchiolar tumors. The incidents show a significant trend. Uh, and they're outside the range, which is much larger uh, number of animals for the B6C3F1. Also, the malignant fibrohistocytoma, histiocytoma, has a value of 5.6%. Very rare. One of those from the, came from this particular study. So of previous 500 animals, only one animal showed this particular lesion. I think this is showing some compelling evidence of a, an effect. In the epidemiology, which is important, uh, the IR, I, I was a member of the IARC panel, and I think a couple of others here were on that panel, classified RF radiation as possibly carcinogenic to humans. This was based largely on the Interphone study as well as the Hardell studies. The working group concluded that these elevations could not be dismissed by bias alone as and that a causal interpretation was possible. Interphone study published in 2011 said the highest level ratio, odds ratios could be due to chance, but also could be a causal effect. More recently, there was a uh, analysis of the interphone component in Canada where they did not see a significant uh, effect after that, that there was a significant effect, it wasn't ruled, recall bias was not ruled, was not a factor in the elevated odds ratio for glioma. So, on my last slide, I think the MTP study is so critically important because it's identified target organs for both tumors and the preneoplastic lesions, which are the heart, the brain, which included DNA damage, and I think the prostate gland, the mouse also, is now Strong concordance between rats and humans in cell types affected, glial and Schwann cells, by RF radiation. This strengthens the animal-to-human association. What happens with this data, or what should happen with this data, is that the FDA would be responsible for conducting the quantitative risk assessment. How can they do this? It's looking at the response rate, which is, I would say, tumors and preneoplastic lesions, as a function of tissue dosimetry, which is the absorbed power times hours per day for the duration of exposure in animals, percentage of lifetime, and extrapolate this to the RF dosimetry in exposed humans. From that, they should be able to quantify the risk for a certain amount of exposure in humans and then determine whether that risk is significant, where EPA, for example, is one in a million is where they judge their risk, because even a small increase in cancer risk could have a serious health impact. Due to the widespread use of cell phones being 300 million in the U.S. and 5 billion worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions to Dr. Melnick from the committee? Yes, Dr. Felton. Um, Susan Felter. So, a uh, quick, over here, <laughs> quick clarifying question. Um, the tables that you showed combining the hyperplasia with tumors for the brain and the prostate, and, and it looked like it, they were just added. Did you go back and look at the individual animal data to see if they were in separate animals so that that total incidence was actually reflective of the incidence of animals? Because you could have hyperplasia and a tumor in the same animal. Yes, I did. And in fact, I didn't read one of my footnotes. Uh, let's take a look at footnote D. So with D, one animal was diagnosed with both adenoma and hyperplasia. Yes, I did check all of those others. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Adler. Rick Adler. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Melnick. Um, how quickly can we get copies of your slides is one question I have. And second is when you say some evidence, are you using the same criteria that the NTP uses when you express it that way? I'm using NTP criteria for some. If I was using my own, I'd say compelling. <laughs> Any other questions? Can the, sorry, can the chair answer my first question? 
Um, so yes, we get we'll get those slides. done during lunch. Yeah. Thanks.